Welcome to another data science deep dive on our technical track. In the following presentation, Sonali Singhal, machine learning specialist at MasterCard, will share some insights about MasterCard's proposal for a semi-supervised solution that learns the complex understanding of healthy and failure log patterns using, using an assemble of deep learning-based density and SQL solutions along with statistical distribution modeling. Enjoy the presentation. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sonali, and I'm going to be presenting server failure prediction using deep learning. Um, so a little bit about me. I'll, I'm working as an applied scientist um, at MasterCard uh, in the AI garage, a uh, machine learning applied scientist. And this project is essentially about predicting when a failure is going to occur in a server. And um, sorry about that. Um, you see that what I mentioned is moving from a research data set to a real world industry server data. I think it's very important to um, understand how we can do that in a real world uh, setting, more moving on from resource data sets that are fairly simplistic. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, a quick overview of some of the pointers that I want to be talking about. Um, taking to the problem statement, I think everyone knows that server failure detection um, as a problem is an important one, but just talking about some of the challenges that are faced in the industry to solve this particular problem. Uh, then I'll take you through some of the data challenges that occur in the industry for this particular problem, which makes it a relatively difficult problem to solve. Then I'll be obviously discussing the approach, uh, which consists of a two-step system, which first detects anomalous log patterns and then failure log patterns. Then I'll be going through all the pre-processing steps, and mainly I'll be concentrating a lot on the deep learning part of it because that's what we're trying to talk about here. So uh, there are a density and a sequential neural network that we have built for this. Um, and I'm going to be spending time on explaining how we built that, how we changed uh, several aspects to make it, to customize it in order to solve some of the data challenges that I will discuss. And also we will obviously take you through the, uh, through the results as well, where for every failure predicted, we are raising only two false alarms. Um, it's very important to ensure a high precision system here, so not to raise too many alarms because that obviously causes alert fatigue to the engineers who are looking over these alarms. So that's where I'll be presenting some of the results. So yeah, um, now that we've discussed the key pointers, I'm going to start talking about the problem at hand, which is essentially server failure prediction. You would have heard of server failure detection, which is to detect when a failure has occurred, um, in a server, but uh, we move on to becoming, making it a little bit more proactive and not reactive uh, into saying server failure prediction. So we all know how important servers are and how that they are an integral aspect in the workflow for many business operations. So every industry has some server or the other based on which they perform some uh, important business um, or some important process. So anything ranging from retail, from technology, and of course, in payments, or like I am in MasterCard. Servers are extremely important, um, and even having an effective and proactive failure management approach is really important to prevent any sort of um, um, impact of a failure. Because um, let me give you MasterCard setting, right? In, in our MasterCard setting, we have these servers called the MIP servers, and these are located worldwide, um, and these route transactions on a real-time basis. By that, what I mean is every time you go to a merchant and uh, make a transaction through MasterCard, uh, that transaction flows into the MasterCard system, MasterCard infrastructure through these MIP servers and then gets authenticated. Um, the problem is uh, an unnoticed failure can cause massive revenue impact as well as reputation impact, mm -hmm. because if you have a failure, mm -hmm. then your transaction is not going to go through. And if it goes unnoticed, it can cause um, a lot of impact in terms of revenue as well which is why this is an extremely important problem for MasterCard. And that is what uh, we were here to solve when we started doing this project. Uh, because of the scale and impact of this problem, we didn't want it to be a simplistic sort of solution that typically industry focuses on right now. So um, we wanted to uh, sort of bridge the gap between industry and research, the deep learning research on these problems and similar problems, and sort of come up with a robust solution that is very capable of dealing with uh, or fixing this problem that is not an easy problem to solve, uh, but also deals with all the data challenges challenges that occur in industry. Some of the challenges that uh, uh, in the current techniques, um, in the current server failure detection techniques are 
that most of them are reactive and not proactive. So servophilia detection and not prediction. They use only a few naive indicators like CPU utilization to predict when a detection is going to occur. But often there are sorry when a failure is going to occur. But often there are many other indicators for this um, and prediction is usually done based on those other indicators that you probably can't see from the human eye, but machines can see that. Um, obviously, like I mentioned, um, there is a problem of alert fatigue to engineers. If you build a simple model and that's giving a lot of false alarms, uh, engineers are going to get very, very, um, they're not going to look at these alerts very seriously and over time your model is not going to be of any use to anyone. So that those are some of the problems that uh, are in industry. I think the major problem um, of any technique that is used in research for server failure detection or prediction is that the data sets do not reflect the challenges that are faced in the industry. They're simplistic data sets. Um, there is no label noise issue in them, uh, which is why supervised techniques work really well for them. But in a real world setting, supervised techniques don't work. And I will explain why. So um, what we have done is we've um, talked about a semi-supervised anomaly detection technique where we combine density and sequential log information for healthy as well as failure log patterns uh, based on which we're able to build this flexible and robust um, methodology in order to solve this problem. So I'm going to now talk about the data challenges or the data overview on the challenges. We all know and understand what the data would look like for this. So every server emits logs and logs are essentially the data point for this problem. Logs are the input for any model that we use for, uh, for this problem where log data consists of um, the following. So there would be a timestamp just to get an indication of uh, where we are. Then there would be several recurrent health check parameters in terms of saying, okay, this is your CPU utilization rate and various others. Uh, obviously once a failure occurs, there would be typical error messages and various other kind of messages that a lot that logs would have for different kinds of servers. And um, also um, you also need information to make to make any sort of model. You also need information of um, when a server had failed in the past so you can gather some insight from that. Um, so we had that at MasterCard. We had several teams who had maintained some information of when a server had failed. So for our problem, we use six months of worldwide server data as training data and six months as test to evaluate the performance. So we used a hefty amount of data because this had to be deployed in a worldwide setting. So it definitely had to perform well, which is why we use so much data. But now let me come to the challenges that we face here. Right? The major challenges is that even though we have, um, you know, server failure data maintained, the time of resolution, uh, the time of failure and resolution is not exact. It's possible that a failure occurred two days back, but it's maintained as failure starting today um, in the file. What that causes is a major problem of label noise. Anyone in machine learning would understand what label noise is and how it can impact the classification model, right? So um, it would cause major conf model confusion if you're if you're calling those two days of data as um, healthy data, but it's actually failure data. So that is one major problem. Then the other problem, which is similar and again causes label noise, is that a lot of failures um, are not reported or maintained anywhere. So they occur and they just go away and no one really gets to know about them. So again, um, that might allow in, in take us to call some healthy data as failure data. And the other problem is that there are also other MIP uh, server related issues like um, power issues, um, connection issues, which also may cause some anomalous log patterns. So it's very different, difficult to differentiate between what a failure is and what an anomaly is because uh, we are interested in talking about failures. So these are some of the data challenges that are faced. I'm going to quickly move on to uh, the two step solution that we have built to solve all of these problems and in fact solve some more problems. So th this is a chart. I'm going to start from the left where we have server logs. Um, server logs obviously get pre processed. I'm going to talk about the pre processing steps. Then we um, pass in through an anomaly predictor. Uh, this anomaly predictor is essentially essentially consists of an ensemble of two models. One is a sequential anomaly predictor and one is a density anomaly predictor. These both are deep learning neural network based autoencoder models or different kinds. I'm going to explain that as well. What these models are trained only on healthy behavior. So healthy log behavior. So they're capable of understanding what a healthy log behavior looks like. So anything that flows through these with a high reconstruction error uh, essentially has some anomalous log pattern. This anomalous log pattern may be because of a failure or maybe because of any other anomaly, right? 
in order to uh, and because they might be because of failures and any other anomaly they they typically tend to be a lot of um false alarms and alarms in this anomalous lock patterns which is why we put them through the failure predictor which essentially has the same models again but these models are now trained on failure lock patterns what that does is it tries to understand from the anomalous lock, lock patterns which ones were the actual failure lock patterns and hence we are able to predict server failure with a good confidence what this two step process really allows us to do is is that it allows us to increase precision and that is what we need in order to mitigate any sort of alert fatigue uh, it also allows us to uh, take care of label noise because this this is actually a semi supervised setting it's not a classification setting um and the impact of a label noise on classification um is not does not come in here um and yeah this is the whole uh, solution and i'm going to be talking about in detail about each of the neural network models as well as the preprocessing step so let me talk about the preprocessing step quickly so because it's text we have to do some preprocessing to get it into a numeric format for your models right so we do some basic text preprocessing like re re removing redundant numbers punctuations and special characters and we get left with about 2 or 2 million unique logs we generate log embeddings or uh, the way we do that is uh, suppose these are three logs you have um then you can actually put that into a sentence or uh, and for each word you can generate an embedding as uh, by using a word to word model so we've used uh, the bag of words model here and uh, sorry the word to word model here uh, and we are able to generate a 300 dimension vector for each of these tokens then what we do is we average out um, each of these embeddings uh, we average out each of the embeddings of the token for each log so we are able to generate log embeddings the model we use here is a continuous bag of words model then we do a k means clustering on each of those particular um um log tokens that we generate and we're able to generate about 170 clusters so what we do is we go from a place where we had these uh, textual um logs and we're able to create numeric numbers for them um from 0 to 170 right so now moving on to the density and sequential approach um what we do is we have um we we realize that it's important to understand anomalous behaviors in both frequency and sequence of logs as well as the relationship between them so we built two auto encoders one is a sequential auto encoder which calls out any anomalous sequence so it basically thinks of a log language as an english language so any time if you see something going off in the log language you can call that as an anomaly and in density what we do is we put in the frequencies so what that does is um if you see one log is occurring too too frequently more frequently than it's expected it would call that out as out as an anomaly so we use both of these together to kind of get the uh, final um result because um modeling these two problems differently allows us to explicitly understand their behaviors so now i'm going to talk about both of these models so the sequential model and the density model and the architectures in more detail so like i said sequential model for anyone who, uh, in the audience who has worked on sequence to sequence architectures or a uh, neural machine translation they would uh, really be interested in this so we've used um lstm based auto uh, auto encoder encoder decoder framework um and the building blocks are as follows so we put in 10 log clusters through a model so this is the encoder on the left is the encoder and then you have the decoder or uh, the first layer is an embedding layer which generates for each of these um clusters it generates a th 300 dimension vector we then put these 300 dimension vectors through a bidirectional layer in the encoder why we use a bidirectional layer and what a bidirectional layer allows us to do is it allows us to flow context from both sides typically in an lstm the context flows from left to right so what goes wrong there is for example if you see um the table uh, the diagram on the bottom left bottom right if i want to build a context for the second word in teddy bears are fun to play with and teddy roosevelt was a president i need to not just know what is happening on the left i also need to know what is happening on the right so a bidirectional layer allows us to model for that from also flowing context from the left from the right to the left and then what it does is it concatenates both so for both the uh, backward flow and the front flow it concatenates both and then you put that to another lstm um and then to another lstm you generate your hidden state of the encoder uh, which essentially flows into the decoder what we also do in the decoder is we use a decoder with teacher forcing um what teacher forcing does is um it starts with the start token and then it also gives um 
in every time step it takes the output of the previous time step so over here uh, i will inform my second time step that okay in the previous one i predicted a 70 right doing so uh, what happens is the model performs better because it knows uh, what the previous time step was predicting in a probabilistic setting uh, and this uh, is less compute intensive as compared to a beam search and a top k approach which is what's required in a production setting so this is the sequential model architecture that we have built um quickly move on to the density model architecture um the density model consists of a stack autoencoder um because it's density so we don't need sequence for that um and we've customized the loss uh, a lot so i'm going to talk about that um the major problem that we faced here is a, is the diagram that is here with the with this network with the orange connections is that the high frequency clusters were the ones that were driving the reconstruction and the low frequency ones weren't being considered much so what we did for that was we customized the loss. So the loss function formula is actually written here. I know there's a lot going on, but essentially what we tried to do is we tried to multiply each of the loss elements by the inverse document frequency. What that would allow for us to do is it would um, um, the cluster that has um, is more important would have a higher higher weightage on the loss. So that is what we wanted. Uh, log cost is another sort of uh, loss that is typically used in these tasks, in particularly in regression tasks, and it works. By, uh, it works in a similar way to MLC, um, but what it does is it is not strongly affected by occasionally wildly incorrect predictions. So it allows us to have or uh, to allows us to get less frequency clusters to have a higher impact on the overall error. We also force this sort of term here, which forces the sum of the output to be one, which is some sort of a regularization term. So it kind of penalizes the high frequency clusters in a similar way to regularization. So this is the kind of customization we made on the density model. Um, and this worked really well for us and stopped solved all our problems that we were facing with the high frequency clusters. Um, and yeah, this is the approach that we've used uh, going back to uh, the overall overview of the two step solution. We anomaly predictor has both these models trained on the healthy data. The failure predictor has both these models trained on the, um, the failure data. But the model architectures remain the same. This is the solution. I'm quickly going to talk about the results, but I just want to mention that I can't give exact numbers here because of confidentiality issues. But I'm going to I'm going to try to explain in relative terms what what happened. So uh, I've given a comparison of all the results in a normalized way. So this is going to say that this is the solution, the two part solution that we talk about. This says that for every failure that we predict, we give out two false positives which may seem like a lot, but it's important to understand that uh, in a in a setting that we are in, in the worldwide setting that we are in, engineers can get potentially millions of alarms in a span of six months. We are only predicting about, uh, we are only giving about single digits alarms in a course of a week to predict a good amount of failures. So we have really, really reduced the number of uh, false positives. If you see, um, if you see above the sequential healthy and all of these are actually generating many more false positives for each true positive. But with the two, two part solution, we've really been able to increase our precision by putting out really less false positives. And this um, allows us to mitigate any problem with a lot of fatigue to engineers, which was very important in the MasterCard setting, but as well as I'm sure it's important in various other settings as well. It's also important to note that um, uh, the 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 plot on the left which shows how how much before were each of these failures predicted so you can see that uh, a lot of failures were predicted six hours before failure which is really good and there were some failures that were also predicted two weeks before failure so this allows uh, any team to take uh, proactive actions uh, in order to mitigate the impact and yeah there also you may um you also see that um these are just failures that we're able to predict but once the failure happens, we're also able to detect almost all the failures because those are relatively easier to do. Um, so yeah, this is what the result is looking like. And where we are right now at MasterCard, we're actually working towards a world world worldwide deployment of this. Um, we also plan to train this every two or three, retrain this every two or three months. So yeah, this is all I had to talk about today. And um, happy to answer any questions and happy to connect uh, if you ever want to talk about this uh, on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect. Thank you.
That was Sonali Single, machine learning specialist at MasterCard. Sonali presented on the MasterCard's proposal for a semi-supervised solution that learns the complex understanding of healthy and failure log patterns using an assemble of deep learning based density and SQL solutions along with statistical distribution modeling. If you'd like to watch more videos like this, you could subscribe to the DSS Insider program where you can see our complete on-demand video repository from a wide range of topics on your own time. You, you can subscribe following the comments in the comment section and please subscribe to our channel below. Thank you!